Well, Christina Maurice, you know, the details that are emerging from this hospital and others around Boston are horrifying. Right here at Mass General, 29 people are being treated, eight are in critical condition. Nearly 100 other people are being treated in Boston's other hospitals. They've suffered from shrapnel wounds, they're missing limbs, they have to have amputations. Now, I was just one block away from that explosion site. I was celebrating my brother's marathon finish, but tonight, what should have been celebratory and joyous has now turned into disbelief. I just walked away, uh, 15 feet away, 20 feet, and you know uh, a, a bomb went off, and uh, it knocked me to the ground, and then you know everybody started running, panicking. A Boston tradition rocked by tragedy, a panic scene as two explosions turned the marathon finish line into a street of destruction. Police rushed to assist victims tangled in debris and broken glass, some of them missing limbs. Bloody spectators were carried into the medical tent that had been intended for fatigued runners. I, I finished in about 30 seconds. Uh, after I finished the, the explosion occurred. In fact, I turned around to have some guy take a picture of me with the finish in the background. I heard a huge explosion. Look, there was a big fireball. More than 100 people were taken to all of the Boston area hospitals, doctors and nurses working to save lives while trying to comprehend the tragedy. What really surprised me was uh, the number of people and just the... Um, Really, the amount of blood, the amount of injuries. Spectators made makeshift tourniquets to stem the bleeding. This man, one of the onlookers, completely lost his feet. Now dozens are still being treated, many of whom are in critical condition. This trauma surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital has already performed several amputations. A number of patients will require repeat operations tomorrow and serial operations over the next couple of days. Now here at Mass General, uh, none of the patients are under 18. The oldest patient here is 71 years old. The doctor here says that most of them were spectators and not runners, but in the days to come, they will need, as you heard, a lot of care and a lot of blood. And that's something that runners and other people all around Boston have already raced to donate. Well, Christine, you know, a lot of runners in their marathon gear walking around their, this city today, their jackets and their medals, a proud reminder of their accomplishment. But the horror of what actually happened at the finish line, it is just starting to set in, and a lot of people are realizing just how lucky they are. Did you give your daughter an extra big hug after all that? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we, we stuck uh, pretty close together for the, for the day. Joe Munson and his daughter Kathleen are heading back to Long Island a bit shaken. This is Kathleen's second Boston Marathon. She crossed the finish line minutes before the blasts. I was walking to meet my dad, had just met him, and we heard two really loud booms and everybody just kind of froze. The city got really quiet. She and her father caught in the chaos. It took them three hours to get to their car that was just blocks away. Lisa Conti was in the Red Cross tent just past the finish and saw the runners racing toward her for help. Crying, um, looking for family members. I, there was one woman I experienced who um, she was sobbing and, and I wasn't sure if she was okay. So I went over to her and she said, you know, no, I'm fine because I just got in touch with my family. Runners separated and stopped short on the course. Josh Hellman's friend was just yards from the end. She was about 50 yards away when um, when the blast occurred. and She was stopped short. She was stopped short, uh, started running the other way, immediately thought of her kids and family at home, and um, just obviously overwhelmed. Now, as the city of Boston and these runners move on, some are worried about what's next. The London Marathon is Sunday. London... From, la from what I remember last year was just as crowded and crazy as Boston is, if not more. So I think they're really going to have to step up security and, and really keep an eye out for anything. And in speaking with a lot of these runners today, they're saddened that their Patriots Day ritual has been ruined, but already they are vowing to be back next year tougher than ever. Well, Christine, hundreds came here. They sang, they prayed, and they listened to the words of Father John Connolly. He told them yesterday near the finish line, evil and violence came once again to our country, and it changed all of our worlds. The people here in Dorchester agreed they are grief-stricken over the loss of a vibrant and happy eight-year-old boy.
They are just 12 years old, but these young girls stood among the hundreds in Dorchester, forced to face the sudden and horrifying loss of their eight-year-old friend. It's very nice that we're all coming together like this just for, for all these people, and it's terrible that any of this had to happen. Marin Bailey went to summer camp with Martin Richard. She shed tears over his death and held a candle in his memory tonight. He was just adorable, and he was, it was really nice to talk to him. Martin Richard was at the finish line with his mother and three-year-old sister Monday. He ran from the stands to hug his father as he completed the course. Moments later, Martin ran back to his mother, and the explosions rocked the stands. Martin was killed, his little sister lost a leg, and his mother was severely injured. Bill Richard, his father, wasn't hurt in the attack that devastated the family, but today he released a statement saying, My dear son Martin, Martin has died from injuries sustained in the attack on Boston. We thank our family and friends, those we know and those we have never met for their thoughts and prayers. I ask that you continue to pray for my family as we remember Martin. And a night of prayer was exactly how this Dorchester community came together to ease its grief. We're just trying to stick together. We're just trying to support them as much as we can. Um, it's a big turnout tonight, um, but I'm really glad that we are all here for them. Um, whatever they need, we just want to help them with it. They'll get through it. But do I need to say? No, no words can express. How do you get through this? You know, it's your faith, you know. It's just, just a terrible thing. And a relative of the Richard family tells me that Martin's little sister has already undergone three surgeries. His mother is recovering from a massive head injury, but everyone here in Dorchester is keeping the Richard family in their hearts tonight. Well, Dana, there is heightened security here at the federal courthouse in South Boston after that midday bomb scare. Now, the bomb scare came about one hour after authorities released information that they had surveillance video of a suspect. They're hoping that this might be a break in the case that they've been looking for. Sources tell CBS News that the suspect is a young white male who appears to be dropping a black bag carrying the second bomb that exploded near the finish line. Investigators say the suspect in the video obtained from a Lord & Taylor department store is wearing a gray hoodie and a baseball cap turned backwards. The suspect was on his cell phone when the first bomb went off. He is then seen quickly leaving the area. According to CBS sources, investigators zeroed in on the suspect using cell phone records that showed who was making calls in the area at that exact time. What's really interesting is if you read the jihadist blogs that are going on, the ones that have the most credible connections to terrorist groups, they are struggling with the same analysis. They're saying, we think this was us, we want it to be us, and this could be, this could be the maturation of ideology where we've put that call out for the lone wolves to step up, and they've done it, and they just don't know how to yeah. claim responsibility. It's interesting to see the investigators are struggling with that question. At the same time, Al-Qaeda on the other side of the world is wondering, was that us? Investigators in hazmat suits searched the scene of the bombings today. FBI photos show the remains of an explosive device, including twisted pieces of metal, charred wires, and a battery. One photo shows a half-inch nail and part of a zipper stained with blood. Those items are now being analyzed at FBI headquarters in Virginia. Investigators say the devices were pressure cooker bombs packed with shrapnel. The lid of one apparently blew to a nearby roof. Keep dispersing away from the building. Get out of the way of the building. At the federal courthouse, an afternoon bomb scare forced hundreds of journalists back 100 yards from the Moakley Federal Courthouse in South Boston while courthouse workers rushed out. It came over the loudspeaker code red. We've all had training on what to do when it's code red, get out of the building, go to your meeting spot, so we did that. Now at this point, no one or no group has stepped forward to take responsibility for the blast that happened on Monday. And despite that video, the surveillance video of the suspect, authorities are still urging the public to come forward and give them any videos or pictures that might aid them in this ongoing investigation. At that briefing just minutes ago, FBI Special Agent Deloria said that hundreds of agents have been working around the clock. They've been working with the Boston PD, also the ATF and the state police. They've been sifting through thousands of leads and tips and they finally do have pictures of two suspects. Now they're telling the public that they are not in any imminent danger, but they do warn that these two men are armed and dangerous. 
Our first look at the suspects in Monday's marathon bombing. The FBI releasing still shots of surveillance video taken near the finish line. It shows two men the FBI are calling suspect number one and suspect number two. The first man has a dark hat. The second has a white backpack that authorities say contained the explosive used in the second blast right outside the Forum restaurant on Boylston Street near the finish line. The FBI now has faces but are appealing to the public to get names. The FBI has relied upon the public to be its eyes and ears. With the media's help, in an instant, these images will be delivered directly into the hands of millions around the world. We know the public will play a critical role in identifying and locating these individuals. Somebody out there knows these individuals as friends, neighbors, co-workers, or family members of the suspects. Though it may be difficult, the nation is counting on those with information to come forward and provide it to us. No bit of information, no matter how small or seemingly inconsequential, is too small for, for us to see. Authorities are calling these men armed and dangerous, telling people not to approach them and immediately call police if they're spotted. We consider them to be armed and extremely dangerous. No one should approach them. No one should attempt to apprehend them except law enforcement. Let me reiterate that, reiterate that caution. Do not take any action on your own. The two explosions blasted through two spectator spots at the finish line. Three people were killed, 170 others injured. The three dead include 8-year-old Martin Richard, 29-year-old Crystal Campbell, and Boston University graduate student Ling Zi Lu, who was here from China. CBS senior correspondent John Miller explained how the FBI pieced this evidence together. What they've done is they spent the last couple of days choosing the photos that they felt gave them the best chance of some getting facial recognition and, and calling them. After they identified the first suspect, they see his, his um, contact with the second suspect, and they decided to go out with both of them. Now, the second explosion happened just outside the Forum restaurant, which is on Boylston Street. That's where the second suspect was seen placing the backpack. The FBI is asking anyone who is inside the restaurant or maybe even just outside to call them with any tips. They say no amount of tips are too small or too trivial. There are cheering, jubilant crowds all over the city tonight, but the biggest crowd that I saw is just down the street from Beth Israel Medical Center. They're here with excitement. This is where Joe Johar Sarnaya is being treated. Beth Israel is a first-rate trauma center, and Sarnaya received uh, or is in serious condition right now. He received gunshot wounds to both his uh, leg and his neck, and the wounds actually may have resulted from a firefight last night in Watertown that unraveled around midnight or 1 a.m. Now it is imperative that doctors keep him alive to find out exactly what happened and why. That's what authorities said tonight at their press conference. Now, after police brought Sarnaya here. Those police, if you can take a look at some of this video, well, they were celebrated by the cheering crowds that were just down the street. Hundreds of college students. It was an incredible sight. Those students screaming thanks to those police officers who have worked tirelessly over the past week to catch this suspect. We're just cheering for all the police officers. So what, and, you, and people just came out and started... Yeah. Yeah. So you can get a little bit of a feel of it, of how wonderful and incredible a scene it was. Those students were cheering on the police officers as they left Beth Israel here. Again, uh, the suspect, Sarnaya, he is here in serious condition, being treated for gunshot wounds to both the leg and the neck. We are live at Beth Israel Medical Center tonight in Boston. Jessica Schneider, CBS 2 News.